Hello, this video is all about blades, the ones I'd recommend and the ones I wouldn't. And as you can see, I've tried quite a few of them over the years. This is just some of them. One of the main things to understand when choosing a blade is that most of them will fall into three categories. The first is ripping blades, and these are best for cutting in the direction of the grain of the timber that you're cutting. Rip blades have fewer teeth and larger gullets between the teeth, and those large gullets allow for quick, efficient removal of the material that you're cutting through, which makes them ideal for rip cuts. The second is cross-cutting blades, which are best for cutting across the grain of the timber. Cross-cutting blades will have more teeth and smaller gullets between the teeth, and when cutting across the grain of the timber, they leave a much cleaner cut than a ripping blade would. They're also great for cutting cleanly through composite materials and sheet materials like plywood and melamine without causing too much chip out. The third is combination blades and they do a reasonable job at both ripping and cross cuts, but they won't do as good a job as a dedicated ripping or cross cutting blade designed for those purposes would. And they usually have around 40 or 48 teeth. There are three measurements that you'll need to understand that are important for choosing the right blade for your machine. The first is blade size in diameter. So for example, from here to here, this one here is a 210 millimeter blade or eight inch. The bore size, which is this hole in the middle, this one here is a 30 millimeter bore. And that is the size of the arbor on the table saw that this blade fits. Bore size isn't always critical though, as reducer ring adapters are available. So for example, if your machine has a 25.4 millimeter or one inch arbor, you can still use a 30 millimeter blade by also fitting a ring reducer. And these adapters will often come in the packaging of the blades when you order them. The third measurement is the blade kerf, and that's the width of the material removed by the teeth during the cutting process. This one is a 2.8 millimeter kerf, and that means that it will remove 2.8 millimeters of material from each cut. I've got a blade with a wider kerf than that. This one has a 3.2 millimeter kerf, and there are blades with a really thin kerf like this one. I think this one is a 1.6 millimeter kerf. If you're gonna be fitting the blade to a machine that has a riving knife, like the table saw, for example, then it's important that the blade kerf is slightly wider than the thickness of the riving knife. And that's because you don't want your workpiece to go through the blade and then snag on the riving knife while you're making a cut. The riving knife on my table saw measures two and a half millimeters, so I'm happy to use any blade kerf above that measurement. In other words, I wouldn't be able to use a thin kerf blade on this machine without either removing the riving knife, which is a bad idea because it's an important safety device, or fitting a thinner riving knife. In theory, a wider kerf and a thicker blade is going to give you a more accurate cut than a thinner one, because a thinner one is more likely to deflect while you're making a cut, but in practice, I really wouldn't worry too much about that unless you're doing anything to crazy engineering tolerances of accuracy. I've never run into any situations where blade deflection has been an issue for me personally. If you just want one blade that's going to do everything you need it to, for example, if you're working in construction and the cut quality isn't as important as say it would be in furniture making, or if you only intend to make rip cuts with your table saw, or if you, like me, have a table saw where changing the blade is a slow and laborious process because you have to undo loads of fiddly little screws before you can even access the blade, then the chances are that you're not going to want to change the blade every time you make a different type of cut. For those situations, I'd recommend using either a combination blade like this one with its 40 teeth, or you can do what I do and get either a 48 tooth or 60 tooth blade that is designed primarily for cross cutting so that you know you'll always get nice clean cuts when cross cutting or cutting things like melamine, but also using it for the majority of rip cuts too. This blade will still do rip cuts. However, you're going to need to use a slower feed rate when making those cuts and the higher the tooth count, the more it will struggle when cutting through thicker timber like I'm doing here. The problem with cutting slower is that the blade is more likely to cause scorch or burn marks on the material that you're cutting. But in most situations for me, dealing with slower rip cuts and the occasional burn mark is less time consuming than swapping over to a rip blade and then swapping back afterwards. So that generally works for me, but the one exception to that rule is when I need to do lots and lots of rip cuts, like recently when I was ripping a slab of beach into loads of thin slats to clad the headboard and footboard of a bed that I made. In that situation, I took the time to swap over to a 24 tooth rip blade because that sped up the process. And in that situation, changing over the blade actually saved me a significant amount of time. 
If, however, you're happy to spend the time changing blades to get the best possible cut quality for both cross cuts and rip cuts, then I'd recommend getting two blades, one for ripping like this 24 tooth one, and one for cross cuts and sheet materials. And in that situation, you might even want to go higher than a 60 tooth blade, like for example, this 80 tooth blade, which is going to give you even cleaner cross cuts since you're not going to need to use it for rip cuts. I've even seen blades available that have 100 teeth, although I've not tried one of those. Most of the blades we've talked about so far usually have alternating bevel teeth, so that each tooth is ground in the opposite direction to the next, which helps to score through the material that you're cutting with the best possible cut quality. And that's not always ideal if, for example, you want to use the blade to cut joinery on a table saw. So for example, if I used one of those blades to cut a half lap joint or a bridle joint, I would need to then clean up the grooves left by that blade with a chisel. And if you wanted to add another blade to your arsenal to give you even more cut options, then I'd highly recommend these grooving blades by CMT. These have a wide kerf and flat ground teeth to allow you to cut things like rebates and housing grooves or rabbits and dados as they're called in America. These are a great alternative to dado stacks, which if you're in the UK like me, are A, difficult to come by, B, very expensive, and C, most table saws here, mine included, don't have an arbor long enough to take a dado stack anyway. With a tool like a mitre saw, personally, I never make rip cuts on my mitre saw. I know that some people occasionally use them for short rip cuts, but I don't like that. It's not what the tool is designed for, and I'd much rather make those cuts over at the table saw anyway. So because I only use my mitre saw for cross cuts or angled mitre cuts up to around 50 degrees, a cross cutting blade is ideal for that. So I'd recommend either a 60 tooth or an 80 tooth cross cut blade. For the track saw or plunge saw, I use a 56 tooth all purpose blade. This leaves an excellent quality cut and it does everything I want it to. It does tend to struggle a little bit with rip cuts due to the high tooth count and smaller gullets. But again, I'd rather keep one blade fitted most of the time. So I just lower my feed rate accordingly. For the circular saw, I tend to use a lower tooth count thin kerf blade since I only ever use this for rough cutting timber or carpentry jobs, so the quality of cuts isn't really that important. Oh, and by the way, this isn't the one I normally have fitted. This one has quite a high tooth count. I think this is a 40 tooth blade. I generally prefer a thin kerf blade on a battery operated saw as well because it just takes it easier on the motor and you're gonna get more battery life out of the saw too. Blades are one of those things, in my opinion, where it's worth spending the extra money to get something that's good quality. Um, I generally look for either Freud, and I have no affiliation with them, they're not a sponsor or anything, but they make professional level, good quality blades that last a very long time. I work a lot with reclaimed timber, so occasionally I'll cut through a nail or a screw, and the carbide teeth on these blades generally cope with that really well, unless of course your feed rate is too high and you're really ramming the material along with bits of metal through the blade. I've got three or four of them I think and I've had them all for years now and they've never been sharpened and they all still cut really well. They're reasonably priced too considering the life that you get out of them. They're generally between 25 and 40 pounds here in the UK depending on the blade size and the number of teeth. I also really like the Milwaukee ones just as much, but I need to point out for full disclosure that Milwaukee support my channel. But generally my advice would be look for the big brands and get something decent. I've used cheap blades in the past, like these Silverline circular saw blades before I knew any better, and they're pretty awful to work with. There might be other brands of blades out there that are just as good or even better than the Freud and Milwaukee ones that I use, but once I find something that works well for me, I tend to stick with it. The final thing I want to cover is blade cleaning, and that's because it's really important. After a while, the teeth on these blades tend to get a little bit clogged up with residue, particularly if you're cutting a lot of pine or woods that are quite resinous. Cleaning off that residue regularly is going to give you much better quality cuts. I'd probably do it once every couple of months, but if I was in my workshop working every day, then I'd probably do it every few weeks. If you like wasting your money, you can buy specialist products for cleaning them, but there's really no need. All you need to do is put a little bit of washing up liquid in some warm water, let it soak for a few minutes and wipe it away. It comes off really easily and then just wipe the blade dry. If you'd like to help support the channel, plus get early access to my videos, exclusive content, free project plans and cut lists, and the name credit at the end of my videos, you can find links below to my Patreon and YouTube channel membership, or you can make a one-off donation via PayPal. Thank you for watching.